Okay, uh, we'll get started here now. So uh, we're very happy today to have Annika Peter from OSU joining us. Uh, Annika did her PhD at Princeton under Scott Tremaine. After that, went to Caltech for a postdoc, Irvine for a fellowship, and so finally became faculty at the Ohio State University. <laughs> Apparently, it's supposed to think that the internal It's part of our official logo. I didn't realize that when I um, Monica is an expert at the intersection between dark matter, dark matter modeling, and astrophysics, and has worked on topics including the dark matter distribution in our solar system, in galaxies, and ways to use astrophysical observables to probe dark matter models. She will be telling us about some of her recent work. Okay, great. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure to be at CETA. Um, having been a grad student at Princeton and a postdoc at Caltech, I was always mildly surprised that I never ended up here for longer than a couple days at a time because it seems to be what one does if one's at either Princeton or Caltech. Um, so I'm delighted to visit. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, particle colliders in the sky. And I'll explain what I mean by that as we go through the first part of the talk. Um, so I was a totally sure how to pitch things for this audience. So if things are going too slowly, you can tell me to speed up. If there are things that are unclear and you want to spend more time on them, let me know and we can spend more time on whatever is interesting. Um, OK. Um, all right, so the existence of dark matter has uh, sort of been known to humans or suspected by humans for almost 100 years now. So Fritz Zwicky, the notoriously grumpy, or maybe, no, anyways, infamously grumpy Swiss astronomer, <coughs> is often credited as the first person to talk about dark matter. So uh, what Zwicky did is he took a spectra of a bunch of galaxies and coma cluster and then found uh, the basically the velocity dispersion of, part of galaxies in that cluster discovered that ga galaxies were going really, really fast compared to the uh, gravitational velocities he expected the uh, galaxies to have if all that was in the coma cluster were galaxies. So in his uh, paper, which is cited by like everyone, although I doubt anyone has actually ever read it, it's an Acta Helvetica something or other. He, he actually uses the phrase cold dark matter explicitly, although in German, because journals were written in German back then, especially in Switzerland. Um, sometimes people actually credit Captain with the discovery of dark matter maybe 10 years earlier. So he did the thing that we are still trying to do in 2016, which is try to figure out what the local density of matter is at the solar circle. Um, so, uh, so in that case, he was interested in the, the total matter. Of, now we're more interested in the dark matter content. But it's the same sort of deal. We use the vertical motions of stars through the plane of the disk to map out the the gravitational force um, in the disk. OK, but in any case, uh, we have suspected that dark matter exists uh, as a species for um, almost 100 years now. So there's been a lot of uh, lines of evidence leading to the existence of dark matter. The thing that I think even the most skeptical of astronomers, the thing that convinced them that something like dark matter has to exist, um, is uh, the observations of gravitational lensing of merging galaxy clusters. So galaxy clusters are gravitationally bound objects. Many of, they're near and dear to many of your hearts, I'm sure, since this is a, uh, an act uh, loving place. Um, and uh, so the thing about galaxy clusters is that most of the baryon content of clusters is in the form of hot uh, gas. That's marked here in pink. 
Uh, galaxies are very subdominant. So for the whole mass budget of a galaxy cluster, only 2% are in stars and galaxies, uh, which is quite low. And most of it we now know is in the form of dark matter. This is an image of possibly the most famous merging cluster. This is the bullet cluster. This is the main cluster. It's about 10 to the 15 solar masses. We think the blue part here shows where the dark matter is. Uh, its presence is inferred through uh, gravitational lensing. This is the bullet. You can see this nice bow shock here in the gas from this bullet uh, as it slammed through the main cluster. And the thing about this is that the baryons in this cluster are very offset from the gravitating mass of this cluster. So a lot of, for a long time, there was definitely a thread where people um, tried to explain all these anomalies, like the fast speeds of galaxies in the coma cluster using some sort of modification of gravity. But it's really hard to create a system like this where the baryons are so offset from the gravitating mass of the cluster without the existence of dark matter. OK, so what do we know? So thanks to cosmology, uh, we know that uh, actually the abundance of dark matter uh, quite well. Uh, basically, if you look at the temperature fluctuations in the CMB at early times, or the distribution of galaxies at late times can only really create this if you have dark matter seeding the potential well uh, of the universe. So based on both the early time and late time uh, observations, uh, we're pretty sure that uh, we know almost exactly how much dark matter there is in the universe. Uh, we also know that dark matter cannot consist of baryons. So we also, just as we know the amount of dark matter in the universe pretty precisely, we also know how much <coughs> of the universe is in the form of normal matter, uh, which in astronomer speak we call baryons. Uh, we can let the nuclear physicists cringe over that uh, somewhat. Um, OK, but both this pattern of temperature fluctuations at early times, as well as uh, the uh, abundances of light elements uh, that were created in Big Bang nucleosynthesis tell us that baryons are only about 4% uh, of the mass energy uh, budget of the universe, whereas dark matter as a whole is more like a quarter of the mass energy budget. OK, so we have a, this concordance model of the universe. And apologies if you've seen this before. I like to use this image whenever I get, especially since it'll probably be at least a decade before I have enough time to bake cupcakes from scratch again. Um, but we now have a concordance model of the universe where baryons are 4% of the universe. And you can think of them as like the sprinkles on the cupcake. There are a few of them. They're scattered around. But you know, do you really eat a cupcake for the sprinkles? Uh, not, no. Um, OK, and baryons make up everything that we see, though. So maybe if we were a sprinkle, we would care about the other sprinkles, just like we as baryonic objects care about the other baryons. Dark matter makes up most of the, um, uh, or sorry, dark energy makes up most of the universe, about 70%. Um, and we don't know what this is, uh, but, you know, I, I am more of a frosting person than a cake person, so I'm like, OK, whatever. I'm just not going to worry about that right now. OK, dark matter makes up a quarter of the energy budget of the universe. And I think this is really interesting. And one reason, aside from enjoying chocolate cupcakes and especially frosting, chocolate frosting, why I like this picture, has a nice analogy with what actually happens in the universe, which is dark matter is sort of the glue that holds baryons together. So without dark matter seeding these potential wells in the universe, it would be really hard for gas to collapse and cool into galaxies. So just as the frosting is holding these star sprinkles onto the cupcakes, uh, dark matter is sort of is holding the, our galaxies together. Um, OK, so what do we know about dark matter other than how much of it there is and that it, it cannot consist of standard model particles? <laughs> 
Uh, we know that dark matter hardly interacts with light. Um, one way I like to think about this is like, if you look at this image, this is of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Uh, we can see light coming from these extremely distant, very old galaxies. If dark matter had significant interactions with light, uh, you might think that uh, the light might scatter off the dark matter um, and that we just wouldn't see the galaxies that are further away. Sort of like a GZK effect uh, for, um, for dark matter. We also know that dark matter can form small dense structures. So this is an image, if you will, of the Milky Way satellite Coma Berenices. These red points mark the individual stars that make up this galaxy. Um, we can measure the, the luminosity of this galaxy. It's about 3,000 solar luminosities, which is quite low. And through the kinematics of the stars, we can also measure the mass inside the half-light radius of this galaxy. And in solar units, it's something like 400. So there's a lot of dark matter in this little galaxy, especially compared to baryons. Um, we're finding more and more of these small, dense uh, subhalos. Uh, in particular, the Dark Energy Survey um, has found um, uh, a little more than a dozen uh, candidate satellites of the Milky Way. This is the DES footprint down here, uh, and these are uh, uh, their candidates in red here. Uh, PanSTARS has also found a couple. There's been another survey. Uh, the Atlas survey in the south where they found a couple. Uh, and then there are a couple of other, you know, random satellites of the Milky Way that have been found in other contexts um, in the past year or two. So it's exciting times we're discovering all these uh, small dark matter um, halos living within the Milky Way and, and as they're being traced by the few stars that survive in them. Um, we're actually finding these things now in other galaxies. So this is an image of a candidate ultra-faint dwarf around NGC 2403. It's part of this mad cache survey that I'm involved in. So we do a lot of navel gazing with the Milky Way, of saying how weird is our satellite system? Can we learn something about dark matter or galaxy evolution with the Milky Way? But we don't know how weird the Milky Way is, so we want to find little, we want to find satellite systems of these little tiny dark matter halos around other galaxies as well. Um, I'm also uh, at the beginning stages of a survey of uh, uh, satellite systems around about 20 nearby galaxies uh, using uh, the LBT at OSU. So if you're interested in that survey, you can talk to me afterwards. Uh, but we think we've also found a few interesting objects. Okay, we also know that dark matter can't be especially fast. So, um, so if you simulate the universe with something like massive neutrinos, and by massive I mean, uh, you know, EV to tens of EV scale, in terms of mass, what you find is that uh, there is not a whole lot in the way of structure. You've got these big sort of super cluster sized structures and maybe some filaments, but you don't see the sort of sub uh, megaparsec structure that you see, for example, in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So if dark matter is really fast, it can escape out of these little primordial density fluctuations that inflation or something like it lays down. You just wash out structures on scales smaller than the free streaming scale. Um, instead, the large scale structure of the universe seems more consistent with having sort of a non relativistic dark matter particle that just sort of essentially to first order sits where it's born. Uh, if you think about sitting where it's born in maybe a more Lagrangian um, uh, context. Um, okay, so what don't we know about dark matter? Uh, well, we don't know what it is. Um, so the dominant paradigm, essentially for aesthetic reasons, is what we call the WIMP CDM paradigm. So WIMP is more of a particle-y description of this paradigm. CDM is sort of the more uh, cosmological uh, picture of this paradigm. 
So a weakly interacting massive particle uh, is the long form of WIMP. This term, I believe, was coined by my uh, colleague Gary Steigman at OSU, along with Mike Turner, um, uh, back in the 80s. And sort of what we, what we mean by WIMP is that we want to have a sort of atomic mass particle that has roughly electroweak interactions with standard model particles. The nice thing about a WIMP in this context is that you can essentially uh, create the right amount of dark matter in the early universe uh, through thermal freeze out. Uh, so in addition to that nice feature, WIMPs are uh, in theory detectable using uh, particle physics experiments. Um, and so the fact that you can sort of naturally explain the amount of dark matter in the universe and the fact that you have a prayer of detecting it are both very strong aesthetic reasons to like this model. WIMPs are also generally non-relativistic. They're born cold. Uh, and in most models, they're also collisionless, ex except for this little bit of collisionality you need to have the right relic abundance. And uh, they're also really stable. Um, and this is cosmologically nice, because you can reproduce, for example, this uh, this snapshot of the Sloan, uh, the Sloan s snapshot of uh, the nearby galaxy distribution with, something, with a dark matter candidate that looks sort of like this. Uh, this candidate is also somewhat uninteresting, uh, which I'll talk more about why I consider it uninteresting in a little bit. Okay, but this is sort of the dominant paradigm, and so if you look like at a like a uh, distribution function of money uh, spent on trying to detect different dark matter particle candidates uh, per unit particle candidate. It's not quite a delta function on WIMP-like ca candidates, but it's also not so far away. So we throw some money at axions and a, a few dollars at some of the, uh, the types of particles that I'll talk about a little later, but to first order, WIMPs are getting the money. So I just, before I go into what some of these other particle candidates are and why it's interesting to explore them, I'll just talk a little bit about how you try to detect this sort of WIMP dark matter candidate uh, because it's good to know about it and also because sort of the next five or so years are sort of the make or break years for these um, candidates. Okay, so what are some WIMP CDM tests? So one way that we dearly hope to find WIMPs is in the lab. So uh, at CERN, um, uh, at the LHC, uh, people are colliding very relativistic protons at each other and hoping that in the spray of gunk that comes out uh, when you collide protons at each other that you, um, that you create some uh, WIMPs in the process. So the signature of this type of event is that when you uh, look for all the um, standard model particles coming out of these showers, that you basically can count up the energy of all of this, and then you find some missing energy in the event. And that, you uh, say, is a WIMP. Um, so uh, the one significant foreground for this type of search is that a neutrino is also essentially a it's not a WIMP because it's light, but it's, you maybe could call it a LIMP, uh, uh, sorry, WILP maybe. Um, in any case, uh, neutrinos are a foreground for the search. So you have to be uh, careful with estimating your standard model foregrounds for this sort of search. Um, uh, okay, so another way that you could try to find uh, real evidence for WIMPs is uh, by looking at places where they're destroyed in the universe. So just like you can create WIMPs in the early universe by having um, uh, standard model particles whack into each other and create WIMPs, at late times the reaction goes the other way, that WIMPs collide and destroy themselves and create standard model particles that you can then see. Um, so the channel which we are most interested in exploring is this WIMP2 photon channel. So it's pretty subdominant because, again, dark matter doesn't really interact much with light. Uh, but whatever light you do, 
uh, produce, you can detect with a satellite like the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. Okay, so there are a lot of ongoing searches for uh, WIMPs this way, and actually one of the best targets to look at are these little tiny satellites of the Milky Way. They're basically nearby big, or relatively big puffballs of dark matter with no gross astrophysics in them, and so they're pretty nice uh, targets for these searches. And so the best constraints on WIMPs come from, from those. Okay, finally, you can directly detect WIMPs that sort of, uh, galactic WIMPs that sort of flow through us all the time. So the fun fact is that you have many dark matter particles streaming through you at any given time. Uh, you also have a lot of neutrinos um, flowing through you at any given time. A fun order of mag question, which I've given students before, is to figure out uh, you know, when a supernova goes off, how many people saw like bursts of Cherenkov radiation in their eyes as neutrinos hit, uh, hit the uh, water, your eyes. You can also sort of think about yourself as a dark matter detector, and you can also figure out how many dark matter particles actually scatter into parts of you uh, at any given time, which is kind of a fun ac uh, activity if you like doing order of magnitude problems like that. Okay, but the idea here is that dark matter streams through an experiment all the time, and we're trying to look for a dark matter particle with some relative velocity to whack into a, a nucleus in your experiment and impart a bit of kinetic energy Q. Um, so the amount of energy that we're talking about, this kinetic energy is sort of equivalent to the kinetic energy of a red blood cell and flowing through a capillary in your body. So you're looking for that amount of energy in a couple of events per ton of material per year. Um, and so these experiments are hard. They have to be very deep underground and very well shielded so that cosmic rays don't mess you up. Um, okay, and then the WIMP comes out of the experiment because it has a low cross section that doesn't interact again. That's actually important because neutrons are a big foreground for these experiments, but they tend to multiple scatter. Um, so, or at least enough of them do that you can get a handle on your single scatter background. Okay. So the problem with WIMPs is that we still don't have any detections. And uh, depending on which particle physics colleague you talk to on a, any given day, at least for me, I get reactions that range between mild to severe anxiety about the fact that we haven't seen anything in any experiment so far. So uh, almost a year ago, the particle community was really excited because they saw an excess of um, of photons at the LHC, um, and uh, so they found this basically this resonance, which, if real, would suggest the existence of a 750 GeV particle. And so there were like literally hundreds of papers written on uh, this um, uh, on this um, anomaly. So this is again the significance of the anomaly. Uh, uh, so, you know, it's a little more than three sigma a year ago, so, you know, by cosmological standards, that's maybe, you know, you would not want to claim a detection. Um, but, uh, and the experimental groups also did not claim detection, but that has n never stopped a theorist from writing a paper. Um, the depressing thing over the summer is that basically with the new data set, this sort of went away. So this is now the combined significance in black. It's sort of at the two sigma level. Um, so, you know, so that appears to have gone away. And since then, there's been nothing new that's really come up. So we're still in this, this situation where we basically have no data in support of this um, really aesthetically pleasing dark matter paradigm, uh, but for which there's no actual direct evidence. So, um, so uh, I talked about the sort of WIMP paradigm as being a little boring. What I mean by boring is that you can actually get some really cool <laughs> things go on when you relax some of these assumptions about dark matter. You can still come up with 
uh, type of model which is consistent with observations but might have some interesting phenomenology that you can unveil in the relatively near term. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to relax this collisionless assumption and allow dark matter to have pretty strong interactions with itself, as well as these sort of low-scale interactions with baryons that give you uh, the right amount of dark matter in the early universe. Okay, so there are a couple of, there are a few different ways you can think of as uh, for allowing dark matter to have um, a strong self-interaction. So um, one idea is that dark matter lives in some sort of hidden sector. So imagine that we have some grand unified theory of physics, and then at some lower scale, some symmetry breaks here. Our standard model breaks off into one part of the sector, but then we also have some sort of hidden sector over here. So, and this sector may or may not communicate with us through anything other than essentially uh, loop diagrams that loop us back to these high energy scales. So just like for the standard model, we've got a bunch of different particles and we've got a bunch of different uh, force carriers. You could imagine that we could have a hidden sector of dark matter where there are a bunch of different particles and a bunch of different force carriers. So, um, so there have been a few different types of models people have thought of. Um, a lot of them having some sort of analogy to the standard model. Um, I'll just talk about a couple of the, the different ways people have thought of to boost dark matter particle self-interaction in these hidden sectors. Okay, so one way is through having some sort of uh, uh, analogy with our electromagnetic sector, which is to say that maybe we have dark matter particles that can at, interact through each other by exchanging a dark photon. Um, so this came into vogue on the particle side uh, while I was uh, a postdoc. Um, the reason that particle people got really excited at the time is uh, there was this experiment called Pamela, which actually is still, it's a satellite experiment, it's still going, but it's a cosmic ray, um, it's a cosmic ray measurement experiment. And they found that, um, uh, at sort of 10 GeV and above energy scales, there were a lot of positrons, cosmic ray positrons. So cosmic ray pro positrons, you don't often get as primary, uh, primary cosmic rays for a lot of familiar sources. So in supernovae, you basically don't get primary uh, positrons at all, um, uh, or in AGN. So, uh, you typically, for those standard models, only get positrons as secondary particles, so you've got some primary cosmic ray proton whacking into the ISM, produces a bunch of pions, those pions can shower to, among other things, positrons. And so this high flux of positrons got uh, a lot of particle theorists really interested in being able to create those via dark matter annihilations. The trick, though, is that if you take the, the cross-section you need to produce dark matter in the early universe and apply it to today having dark matter annihilate, um, it was like three orders of magnitude too low. So one thing that uh, particle physicists thought was, well, if you have some sort of um, dark photon, you can really bump up the interaction cross-section um, so that you can have enough dark matter annihilating to explain these Pamela 10 GeV um, po positrons. It turns out that if you look at the Feynman diagram, if you basically open up this point here, uh, you can actually get, just as you can get an enhancement in the dark matter inelastic scattering cross-section, you can also boost the dark matter elastic scattering cross-section uh, up to something that is actually cosmologically relevant. Um, okay, so another analogy people have had is like instead of, you know, having some analogy with the electromagnetic interaction, maybe we can have sort of a more strong force analogy. So there have been a bunch of papers written on that, but one way to think about it is that, um, especially for low energy scattering, you could imagine that dark matter scatters off each itself just like neutrons can scatter off itself. So this is really a billiard ball, you know, uh, uh, isotropic uh, 
almost velocity independent uh, uh, interaction at non relativistic um, speeds. Okay. All right, so the question is, okay, so now we've like ripped off this collisionless assumption. We've assumed that dark matter lives in a hidden sector where uh, it can have uh, interactions mediated by some dark force. How do we test these models? How can we tell that we're living in that universe rather than a WIMP universe where the WIMP is especially WIMPy? Um, so what I want to talk about is testing uh, this paradigm using uh, particle colliders in the sky. So just like we use particle colliders like uh, the LHC to smash particles together and try to learn uh, about new particles uh, in the spray of particles that come out of those interactions, I want to see what we can learn from particle colliders in the sky, where you have two blobs of dark matter whack into each other and then you see what happens in the aftermath of that. So this brings us back around to the bullet cluster. So I talked about the bullet cluster as being a nice example where modified gravity cannot really give you what you see, where you really need dark matter. Uh, and I have to say, for some of my really non-cosmology colleagues, uh, like you know, this is what convinced them that dark matter had to exist. But um, uh, but I but. You can also use uh, these things not as just an existence proof, but a way to actually learn more about the microphysics of dark matter. Um, okay, so the bullet is like maybe the most dramatic example of a particle collider in the sky. So the bullet is uh, one sort of 10 to the 15 solar mass dark matter blob whacking into a sort of 10 to the 14 solar mass dark matter blob. But you can have even, uh, um, but you can have even, there are a lot of, have been a lot of other systems observed where the two masses are even possibly even bigger. Um, so, uh, and uh, these have also been sort of, these have been also previously been explored a little bit for self interacting dark matter constraints. So, um, so we've got the bullet, we've got the baby bullet, we've got something called the musket ball. There's a CZ cluster. I've highlighted here just the sort of clusters that have really been mapped out by some of my collaborators at UC Davis. There are actually many more, including um, the El Gordo cluster, which was discovered in ACT and SPT. Um, and the two ways. Okay, yep. Um, so these are sort of the tip of the iceberg. And uh, an issue would be, for example, in simulations to go in and say uh, what fraction of clusters should give some kind of, I mean, obviously the blending of each other uh -huh. should give reasonable evidence. Um, uh, I mean, El Gordo is interesting, but it's, um, it's not as uh, dramatic. As yeah. Well. Yes, yeah, so that's a, I'll talk about that a little bit, but I agree that really exploring sort of typical, more typical systems is really interesting. Um, and I'll get into that a little it's more. It's complicated because of the interactions. Yes. But on the other hand, you know, our simulations are good enough that we should mm -hmm. be able to do an interesting separation there. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so I'll talk just briefly about the bullet uh, and then talk about the simulations we did on uh, one class of merging system, the equal mass mergers. Um, so the bullet is more of a 10 to 1 mass ratio merger, uh, but it has gotten the most press. Um, so the way that people have tried to constrain uh, the dark matter self interactions is one of two ways. So one is and this I'll get into a little bit more, is this hypothesis if dark matter is really collisional, that um, it will, when dark, these halos interact, they'll experience a bit of a drag force. Um, and so one thing people have done is they've tried to look at where the peak of the galaxy's distribution lies. So if you take sort of a smooth number density uh, of, of galaxies where the peak of that number 
density is, and compare that to where the peak of the dark matter distribution is. With the, again, the idea being that if dark matter is collisional and there's some sort of drag-like force on it, that it might lead to a separation between the galaxies and dark matter. So uh, this is, these are a couple of plots from a paper by Randall et al. Um, here, you know, the galaxy peak is not so offset for this bullet from the um, dark matter peak. Uh, they also looked at the mass to light ratio. So, uh, okay, so let me back up and say that when they uh, translate um, uh, uh, this separation to cross-section space, they find uh, this sort of curve right here. They also looked at the mass to light ratio, the idea being that as the bullet speeds through this big cluster that you can actually uh, strip particles off of the little cluster, uh, the relative speed between the subclusters is large compared to the escape velocity from the subcluster. And so in particle interactions, you can actually ej directly eject particles out. And so here they show how much the mass to light ratio changes of the at the subcluster as a function of cross section as you're ripping particles out. Uh, yep. On the scale of this uh, image, how much do you expect the galaxy and dark matter needs to be in alignment, even absent the amount of drag? So, um, so galaxies are effectively collisionless particles, and so if the dark matter and galaxy distributions are comparable, then you expect no separation. Um, on the other hand, if, dark, if galaxies are, for example, less bound to the cluster than dark matter, so they're more, you know, they're not as centrally concentrated as the dark matter is, then you get extra, potentially extra effects where it's, you know, easier to strip stuff off of the outer parts of a galaxy cluster, and then when you try to make a map of where the galaxies lie sometime after collision, you might get some little bit of a separation, but that is actually not that well quantified. Um, there should be a paper out by uh, a former grad student at UC Davis, uh, Karen Eng, on to address some of these issues um, soon. Okay, so from the bullet, there were constraints of about a centimeter squared per gram. And actually, a lot of constraints on self-interacting dark matter models uh, claim constraints of order centimeter square per gram. Uh, and that is generally because the sort of surface density of dark matter in, um, in galaxy to cluster sized halos is of order a gram per centimeter square. So it's maybe not surprising that the cross section constraints are, you know, in units of one over, the, one over that uh, surface density. Okay, so, um, so, you know, there's only been really this one simulation paper, or at least at the time we started this work, there have been a, uh, a couple of papers that also appeared over the summer. But one of our concerns was that, well, there was only one set of simulations for this one object. There are a few questionable assumptions in this, um, in this paper. We just wanted to see how robust this idea is that you get a separation between the dark matter and the galaxies in a cluster <coughs> as a function of dark matter cross-section. And we also just wanted to see if there were maybe other more interesting signatures of self-interacting dark matter in these collisions. Yep. Um, just to get some context, about how large of a cross-section um, would mean that these dark matter self-interaction effects start to be similar to feedback mechanisms in galaxies. So it's also of this, okay. yeah. So this is sort of relevant to that. Yeah, yeah. So if you're interested in, uh, I'm not going to go into cores and feedback, but if you're interested, I can. I'm very happy to talk offline about that. Um, okay. So, uh, so in this paper, the sort of tome or treatise on the subject, uh, it's about 30 pages. So you know. Uh, I would say, uh, if you just want a quick tour through what we did, reading the intro is interesting, uh, and then reading uh, section six. Those are the, probably the two most interesting uh, parts. Uh, we discussed in detail what happens if you have equal mass 
mergers and what the signatures of self-interacting dark matter actually is in these equal mass merging systems. So again, these are sort of rare systems. So El Gordo is about an equal mass merger. Um, but the reason we chose these systems is that there are some observational analogs. And in some of those systems, people have claimed large offsets between the galaxies and dark matter. And also in terms of just running simulations, and this was Stacy's first year project, which then was finished at the end of her third year. Uh, her com thesis committee has accused me of assigning her basically a PhD thesis instead of a first year project for a first year project. But um, anyway, so it was uh, just easier in terms of both running the simulations and analyzing them to uh, look at equal mass mergers. So that's what we started with. Okay, so again, a galaxy cluster has, just to remind you, has a ton of dark matter. Um, it has a few galaxies and some highly collisional gas. The interesting thing here is that clusters contain both, sort of bracket sort of the range of cross sections that we're looking for dark matter. So we've got, got both sort of the collisionless case, like galaxies, and we've got highly collisional gas. So that's another reason why these systems are interesting. Okay, when clusters collide, um, the hypothesis has been that all of these parts of the cluster separate a little bit. So the more collisional parts, like the dark matter, end up closest to barycenter. The collisional galaxies move far ahead, and we'd like to know what happens with the dark matter and how that maps into cross-section. Okay, so what we did is we did a series of staged simulations. So we took spherical dark matter halos. In reality, uh, galaxy, cluster halos are far from spherical, but we're doing the spherical cow before we do something more complicated. Um, we took stage, we did stage simulations where we basically uh, changed not just the cross section, but the merger kinematics. So we tried to explore a range of cosmological uh, impact parameters and collision velocities. And our goal was to see what observables there are and how they change, not only as a function of the cross section, but as but of the merger configuration. Okay, so let's see what a CDM merger looks like. Um, so in this case, uh, so in the upper panels, what we're plotting here are for the two halos, the separations of their components from the barycenter. You can also tell this has to be an equal mass merger because um, our two halos follow basically identical trajectories around the, identical but sign flipped trajectories uh, around Berry Center. Um, and this is the galaxy dark matter offset down here. So for CDM, uh, we basically don't have an offset between the galaxy distribution and the dark matter distribution. Um, uh, and you can see that also just in the orbits of the components. <sighs> okay, sorry about that. Uh, this appears to have crashed. Okay. Okay. All right. So this is what happens when we toss the cross section up to something like three centimeters squared per gram. Um, so here you can, you can see um, uh, some differences. Uh, so you can see already up here that these dark and, uh, uh, these black and red lines which denote uh, the dark matter and galaxies respectively, you can see that they start to not lie totally on top of each other. Uh, and in particular, when we look at the dark matter galaxy offset, we find something, uh, an offset that's something at best of order 40 kpc, and this maximum offset occurs uh, right after paracenter um, passage. Okay. Um, and there are some other uh, differences in here. One thing is that the system uh, uh, virializes much more quickly. The dark matter scatter is a boost above the gravitational scatter to virialize the dark matter, which is interesting. Is 
Uh, so this is of order. That's a good point. So this is uh, this is uh, a few gig years right here. Uh, is there any prospect of seeing galaxies that have emerged for a while that these dark matter is much more concentrated than, uh, than stellar matter? Uh, so we'll talk about that. Uh, no, just a few minutes. Okay. So uh, what we've done here is we've mapped um, sort of our different uh, simulations into this plane where here is the sort of maximum offset on this axis. Here, this is uh, basically the time between paracenter passages. And you should read it as sort of like uh, sort of a proxy for how long um, some amount of offset is visible. Most of the time, the amount of offset that's visible is not much, but it's sort of a proxy for how much. Um, okay, so for one centimeter square per gram, we see a maximum offset that's about 10 to 20 kpc. Uh, this is for our sort of um, uh, fiducial sort of uh, merger configuration. Um, so this is a head-on merger with a uh, merger when the two halos touch, that's about 1,000 kilometers a second. Um, if you go down in velocity, you tend to get a little bit of a higher um, offset, although not by much. And if you crank up the velocity for one centimeter square per gram, you don't see in really an increase or decrease of the cross-section, or sorry, of the offset for that cross-section. We also played around with changing the dark matter concentration of the halos. Um, uh, and so you get a bigger offset if you have a more concentrated um, uh, halo. You get less of an offset if the uh, dark matter is less concentrated. Um, and then we played around with the impact parameter. So our default configuration is a head-on merger. Uh, we also tried quite large of impact parameters up to sort of a megaparsec um, and don't see huge differences in terms of sort of the maximum offset. Okay, so we also um, looked at several other cross sections. So of course we did CDM for everything just to, as a sanity check um, and also uh, as a nice example to show that we get zero offsets in all cases. We start cranking up the cross section to first three centimeters square per gram, where here you never get an offset that's more than 50 kiloparsecs. And then when we crank things up to the quite high cross section of 10 centimeters square per gram, I don't actually even show a few of the cases because those systems merged on impact. But for the systems that are left, they can show um, offsets of up to sort of 150 kiloparsecs. Uh, but they're pretty short-lived, and the, also these systems are really disrupting, and so these are probably also not physical. Um, so the sort of cosmologically relevant range where we have, when we have simulations where the systems, where the two halos pass through each other, and you're not catastrophically destroying them, uh, you're really in this sort of range right here, and in looking at this sort of range of cross-sections. Okay. So let's compare with observations. So we've just shown that you probably never get more than about a 50 kpc offset between galaxies and dark matter, and those are pretty short-lived. Um, how does that compare to, with claims in the literature? Um, so uh, so uh, in both the Sausage Cluster and the El Gordo Cluster, uh, there are some modest claims for offsets. These, I would say, are not really statistically significant. Um, for El Gordo, maybe for one of the subclusters, um, it is. But the sort of scale uh, that people talk about are more of order 100-ish uh, kiloparsecs for offsets. So what we find is that we just really cannot explain those offsets with um, with self-interacting dark matter models, no matter what the claims and telescope proposals are to get more time, uh, that you know it's just really not feasible. Instead, we showed the challenge of trying to use this offset method is you really have to beat down the systematics of your observations to the sort of 10 kiloparsec level, which uh, for both sort of galaxy counts and for lensing is going to be very challenging. 
Um, so that was kind of a downer. Um, we have been working a lot with um, um, observers uh, who have studied these systems in great detail. And I, I know they were probably not super thrilled to see that dark matter is not going to be the solution to their offsets. Um, and we were kind of disappointed, too, because it's always more fun to write a discovery paper than a, ah, sorry, this idea will not actually work paper. So uh, uh, for every CDM to pull up class of the cluster, which then, by its very nature, has lots of merging yeah. uh, is the computational cost essentially the equivalent of turning on a few of these cases? Uh, or do you have to really change the time steps because of the collision term? So uh, the self-interacting cross-section, um, the self-interacting simulations are significantly more costly than CDM to run. We were doing stage simulations basically because we wanted to do a first exploration. On our agenda is to do a cosmological simulation, but to resolve these scales is going to be, even for dark matter only simulation, uh, probably my guess is a factor of 10 more expensive than a, an equivalent CDM. Uh, yeah, yes, and also to get the spatial resolution, uh, yeah, it'll be, it, so it's both, so part of it is that you have to take much shorter time steps when you're trying to Monte Carlo the scattering, and then in order to get the spatial resolution to tell the offset between galaxies and the dark matter, um, that. So within um, a cluster now, there's a lot of, uh, a reasonable amount of subclustering. So it yes. actually a little bit, you know, it, you know, there's the issue of uh, it not being even close to the hypostatic agreement. Yes. And uh, that isn't just uh, the bulk uh, flows, but um, uh, relatively speaking, the pressure doesn't equalize it either. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, what that means is that there's a shorter distance uh, clumping, mm -hmm. which must have really interesting effects in yes. the transport of uh, with the collision. Yeah. So I mean, right now we simulated basically spherical cows. You know, basically the simplest yeah. realization of the system. But I agree, having all of this real substructure, the fact that um, clusters have a history of mergers and they're not necessarily, you know, virialized before something else hits it. Um, I think it's a very interesting. So did you actually put in galaxies of some finite scale? Uh, so we, uh, so we basically represented them as point particles, but with big plumber softening lengths. Um, uh, in particular with the BCG, we had a relatively large softening length. Um, uh, yeah, so I mean, this is really just sort of the first exploration. Uh, because if this doesn't work for a spherical cow system, it's going to be much harder, almost certainly, for, for a real cosmological system. Yeah, but there are so many amusing effects. Just yeah. So let me give an example, which I don't think operates here, but it operates <coughs> in uh, relativistic heavy ion collisions, so it's a very different problem. Uh -huh. But basically what happens is that, so the usual thing that happens is you get the dark matter plow through and oscillates and it finally settles down. Uh -huh. But uh, sometimes uh, you can sort of leave a, a, a region behind plus a, an attempt at splash. I'm wondering if any, if you have any evidence of phenomena. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we 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 have uh, we've talked a little about the splashback. Um, so in fact, we gave the sort of Irvine simulations to Neil Dalal's group, and they look for splashback, and they didn't find any evidence of different splashback. I have. I think I understand why they didn't see anything, but uh, they they didn't see uh, an effect on the splashback radius there. Um, of course, this is 
Yeah, yeah. So in particular, you know, our particular particle model for the dark matter is a hard sphere velocity independent scatter. So if you have any strong angular dependence in the scatter, I can imagine that you might get a, a different effect. Um, okay, so I want to talk about the thing that we did find that we think might be pretty interesting <laughs> in my last few minutes. So, um, okay, so I talked, when I was talking about offsets between the galaxy and dark matter distribution, is really focusing on what happens before the system virializes. But what we find is that the extra dark matter self-scatter actually helps the dark matter settle down into an equilibrium faster than just if you had gravitational interactions. But to our surprise, but we now think we understand why, what we saw is the galaxies don't reach this nice, you know, virialized state. And in fact, what we find is that if you look at either the peak of the galaxy distribution, which is in red here, or if you just look at the BCG, which is the special galaxy you know, that lies nearly at the center of many galaxy clusters, what we find is that the, the galaxy population as a whole and the BCG actually just oscillate around, essentially in perpetuity. Um, uh, but we don't see this in CDM. So if, if I uh, had the equivalent plot in CDM, you would basically not see any offset. It would just lie basically, the BCG would, or and the peak of the galaxy distribution would just lie right on top of the center of the dark, the dark matter halo. Instead, what we see is that the galaxies, the BCG in particular, oscillate about Berry Center at, on sort of the hundred to hundreds of a uh, uh, kiloparsec scale. And the amplitude of this oscillation uh, is proportional to the dark matter self-scattering cross-section. So what we think is going on is when you have self-interacting dark matter, one of the signatures of that is that it forms a core at the center of the dark matter halo. So it's this interesting dynamical result that in cord halos, um, dynamical friction basically stops working. Um, so there have been a few papers written on this. The most recent uh, interesting and relatively accessible one is written by Justin Reed and his group. But for cord dark matter halos, you, don't, you just don't get dynamical friction. And actually, this, this has been um, suggested as evidence that the Fornax dwarf galaxy, the satellite of the Milky Way, has to have a core because it has a whole bunch of globular clusters around it. And if you run a simulation of a, uh, of a Fornax that has a cuspy dark matter halo, those globular clusters sink to the center in just a few giga years. So it's been thought for of order 10 years that Fornax must have a core because uh, that means that the globular clusters can survive. They don't get sucked in by gravitational or by dynamical friction. Okay, so interesting. So what does this mean for constraints? So there's this really nice recent paper by Todd Lauer and his collaborators where they study a whole bunch of nearby galaxy clusters. They look at the BCGs, they look at, they look at the X-ray emission uh, from these clusters. And what they find is that when they look at the separation between the peak of the X-ray uh, gas, which is basically coincident with the center of the dark matter halo, and they look at the offset between that and the BCG and translate that, in, uh, they interpret that as a probability distribution, they find that it is really sharply peaked at no separation. In particular, when you look at the cumulative distribution of this separation between the, the peak of the X-ray emission and the BCG, um, what you find is that basically half of the BCGs lie uh, within 10 kpc of the center of the dark matter halo. Okay, so what we think that means is that at least for this equal mass merger scenario, um, is that, in, that the remnants of these mergers, if you see a lot of them in the sky, um, that you should be able to statistically exclude cross sections probably bigger than about 0.1 centimeter square per gram. So we need to do a little, we need to do more work on this. For one thing, we need to see if 
the sort of uh, what we call core sloshing um, is as strong in unequal mass mergers. Um, uh, Can you do the separation, you can, of uh, uh, instead of BCGs, uh, where you have uh, two CBs mm -hmm. following the stereo? how you they're know, offset and how they're offset over to the center. Yeah. Has there been a selection on um, I don't know, and it's something that we're starting to talk about. Uh, basically, because, because of this core sloshing thing, there are a lot of interesting avenues that we want to explore. One is observational, like along the lines that you suggest, but also theoretically to see if this is robust to more cosmological merger histories. Okay, but if true, you know, we think that actually this core sloshing thing can give cross-section constraints that are an order of magnitude better than this one centimeter square per gram type limit that I talked about before as being sort of the, uh, the sort of like typical cross-section constraint that you get from a bunch of different uh, types of systems using several different methods. Okay, so there are also some other things that go on. One is, um, you know, compared to CDM, the time for the system to coalesce is much shorter. Um, the, uh, the maximum separation between the dark matter halos before coalescence is also shorter when you've got um, a self-interaction cross-section that's not zero. And so there are a few other things that we think could be good tests of SIDM on the cluster scale. But I think the BCG one, is, this BCG core sloshing thing is the thing that we're most excited about. Okay, so in short, uh, I hope I convinced you that dark matter exists, uh, that it may not be a boring wimp, um, that dark matter may in fact be collisional, and that we can use uh, collisions of uh, galaxy clusters um, uh, to probe the microphysics of these models. Um, and that finally, we think that actually the most interesting constraint comes from when the system has really coalesced. One final sort of more global point that I'd like to make is that, you know, everything that we know about dark matter comes from astronomy and cosmology. So there are all these, what I would call particle physics tests of dark matter to really explore its microphysics. But all we know really about the microphysics of dark matter has come from astronomy and cosmology so far. And so I think, especially in this era of large surveys and much more data on a much wider range of scales, um, that it's really a good time to think about what other microphysical properties of dark matter you might be able to uncover by looking at uh, things in the sky. All right, I'll stop here, thanks. Uh, a lot of discussion before we take maybe just one or so for the questions and then go upstairs for the Um We'll be taking one out of dinner, probably at 6.30, so there should be any more change going on. So um, maybe time for a question. I'm just curious, because the PCG has its own big halo in which it has been tracking to the uh, so that's a good question. We often think of like the central galaxy, like the BCG, as having the whole uh, halo be its halo. So it's a special galaxy, not just because it's often, or most often, the biggest galaxy in the cluster, but it's also one that where the, the cluster halo, so to speak, is a, its host. Uh, whereas the other galaxies that come in, they have their they have subhalos attached to them that have probably been stripped pretty heavily by the, the host as well. But it's a special galaxy for a few reasons. Like that. What about the other galaxies? So they will be in. Um, yes. Um, so uh, so actually, for those. Um, Dynamical friction probably works a bit faster than the dark matter interaction. So I had another paper out earlier this year where we actually looked at whether it's uh, in the Milky in the, the context of the Milky Way whether it's um, this extra dark matter to dark matter interaction or just gravitational dynamical friction plus stripping that governs the evolution of the satellites. And it turns out for most 
reasonable cross sections that it's really for the biggest things that come in still gravity that governs the evolution of those systems. Um, 